What is windowing in signal processing? Well, let's think about an audio processing example. And here we've got a waveform from a musical instrument where at this period of time here, just one note is being played. It's just a sine wave. Whereas at this period of time here and also here, two notes are being played together in a chord. Now, if we want to digitally sample and store this waveform, one thing we could do is to take lots of samples very finely here, to after one after another, and we could store all of those samples. Another thing we could do is to try to have a bit of compression and do things more efficiently. So something we could do is to perhaps divide up this signal into time segments. And then in each time segment, we could try to work out what the frequency is that's in that time sequence. So here, let's say that's F1. In here, it might be uh, two frequencies as we've got from that waveform, F2 and F3, for example. And if we could work out what those frequencies were, we wouldn't need to store all of these samples. All we would need to do is to store the values of the frequencies. And when we play it back, we would just generate those frequencies having recorded just those frequency values. And that would be a lot of compression. So that means we've got a challenge of being able to take measurements over a period of time and then work out the frequencies, whether it's one or two or multiple frequencies. So let's think about how we would do that. Let's start by thinking about a single sine wave. So here's a single sine wave, uh, which goes forever. And in the frequency domain, that has a Fourier transform, which looks like this. There are just two spikes, one positive and one negative at that frequency. So if we're thinking about this time slot here, that frequency, then this would be at F1 and negative F1. So if we were had this signal, then in the frequency domain, we would have this and it would be easy to tell what the frequencies are. There's only one that exists. But now let's think about this uh, challenge because we're only going to be taking measurements over a finite time period. Then we're going to repeat it for other time periods and so on. But let's think about this time period here. So one way to represent that is to represent it as the continuous, so the, the waveform that goes for all of time multiplied by this rectangular function here. And when you multiply these two together, you get this signal here. So what has happened in the frequency domain? When you take this measurement just over that period of time and take this measurement here, what do you have in the frequency domain? Well, because it's a multiplication in the time domain between these two signals here, you're going to have a convolution in the frequency domain. And for more information about these kinds of properties, check out the show notes on this video. There's a whole lot of other videos on the channel explaining all of these various properties and components of Fourier transforms. Uh, so we need to know the Fourier transform of this rectangular so that we can do the convolution. Well, of course, the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a sinc function. And the width of this rectangle is capital T. And the first zero point from this sinc function is one divided by capital T. So again, we multiply in the time domain. So we are going to be convolving in the frequency domain. And when you convolve a function with a delta function, the function gets located where the delta function is. So we have this answer here. So here's our measured sequence that we've measured from the overall sequence. And in the frequency domain, it looks like this. So it's not the nice clean delta functions that we had for this signal, but we've only measured it over a finite time. And now we have this. Now, if this is the only frequency that exists, so for example, in this time period here, then it's not going to be too hard for us to work out where the peak in this Fourier transform is, and we will get the right answer. We'll get the F1, and we can record that and do our compression. But what's going to happen when we have se sequences here, or periods of measurement periods here, for example, where there's two frequencies, or even three or more? Now that a single frequency gets spread out in the Fourier transform, if, the, if there's a second frequency, which is close to this one, and perhaps maybe not with the same amplitude, then it potentially will get swamped out by the side lobe from this frequency. So the side lobes are going to be a problem for us. 
Now let's think about what we can do to try to suppress those side lobes. And that is what we call windowing. Actually, we've already done a form of windowing by multiplying by this rect function, and that's often overlooked. Sometimes this is called no windowing, but in fact, even doing this is windowing. And we use the word windowing because what we are uh, relating to is that you can't see the full signal. You are only seeing part of the signal. Just like if you looked out a window from a house, you wouldn't see the entire landscape. You would only see the portion of the landscape that you can see out from your window. Okay, so let's think about what we could do instead of just this rectangular window. Perhaps we could do different shapes. And for example, let's consider this shape here to try to understand what's possible and what the effect is going to be on the side lobes. So when you see different shapes of windows, it's often uh, something seems a bit counterintuitive because what you're clearly doing here by having this shape of window is you are suppressing the components of the signal at the start of your measurement and at the end of your measurement, and you're amplifying the components in the middle. And in some ways, you might think that that doesn't seem sensible to do. You might think that all of your measurement is just as important as the other parts, the start and the end are just as important as the middle. Why would you compress the start and the end? And I think that's a good question. Let's look at what benefits you get from it, but also try to understand what the trade-off is. So we're going to want to know what the Fourier transform of this is. Uh, and to do that, uh, we can use a property again from Fourier transforms that a triangle is, can be composed of two rectangular functions convolved with each other. And again, uh, look in the show notes, you'll find details on what the convolution is of two rect functions with each other. Uh, the width of this is still capital T, but the width of the two rect functions that go together to form this is t divided by 2. And uh, again, more information about convolution in the show notes. So now we have the convolution of two squares, which can form this function here. So in the frequency domain, we're going to have the multiplication of the Fourier transform of each of these. These are identical, of course. So the Fourier transform of this, just as we had up here, is a sinc function. But now, of course, this is half the length. So the sinc function is going to be twice as wide. So this is the Fourier transform of one of these squares. So now we've got, of course, multiplication. So that's going to be the square of this because these are identical. And so now we're going to have the square of this is going to be the Fourier transform of the triangle. And of course, the square of this is going to be something that looks like this. It's going to be coming down here and it's going to have these small side lobes. So this is important. The shape has changed. It's a more smooth shape for the square and the side lobes are lower. Um, because if, we're, if you think one way to think of it is if we normalize this peak to one, then all of these values are less than one. And when you take the square, they're going to be even smaller. So here we've achieved what we want to. The side lobes are lower so that if we had two frequencies in our measured period of time, then they can now have less impact between those two from the side lobes. But as I said, we've paid a penalty. There is a trade-off. This is now twice as wide. So the width has gone to be twice as wide, but the side lobes are much lower. So this is a benefit from this window function. So that immediately makes you think, well, what about other shapes? And yes, there are plenty of other shapes. Uh, you can find uh, many examples. There's some shapes that go up in a rounded way like this. For example, that could be the top of a sine wave, which is called sine windowing. Or Welsh windowing is another type, which has a different function across the top, but still has this general shape. Uh, other ones look more like this. Uh, and these ones, for example, include uh, Han and uh, Parzen as also uh, Gaussian windowing. And then some other ones which have uh, not setting it to zero at the edges, uh, but still this general shape such as the Hamming window. So lots of different types of windows, all of which have a different compromise trade-off between the width of the main lobe and the suppression of the side lobes. 
So if this has given you more insights into windowing, uh, please like the video. It helps others to find it. Of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And if you check out those show notes, you'll find a web page which has a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.